Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, as we study this very solemn subject this evening, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Particularly, I ask not only for those who are gathered here in this place, but for all of those who are watching this program worldwide. I ask, Father, that you will give us clear minds and you will give us tender hearts to receive your message. And I thank you, Father, for hearing my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our study for this evening is Mary, the Rival of Jesus. And basically I would like to begin by mentioning some of the things that we studied in our first lecture about what the Bible has to say about Mary. And the reason I'm handling my notes is because uh, we're going to be reading several statements this evening and uh, I would like to uh, have these in hand because they're very, very important. Let's review what we've studied about Mary. First of all, the Bible says that she was a great woman. No doubt about that. God chose the best available. We have no record whatsoever about the birth of Mary, where she was born, to whom she was born, or how she was born. We know that she was from David's line. We know that uh, she actually had royal blood in her veins. We also notice that Mary needed a Savior because she rejoiced in the Lord, her Savior. We also notice that there's no record whatsoever of her conception or of her birth. There's no idea that she was conceived immaculately and that she never sinned. Scripture does not address that issue at all. We also don't find anywhere in Scripture that she was a virgin after Jesus was born. In other words, that she was perpetually a virgin. We know from Scripture that technically speaking she was not the mother of God because Jesus was her creator. Jesus existed before she did. We also notice that Mary was not full of grace, but she was the highly favored one. That is the proper translation. In other words, she wasn't full of favors to give to people. She was actually favored by God. And we also notice that the last reference to Mary in Scripture is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, where she is in the upper room with the apostles on the day of Pentecost. There is no record of Mary's death shouldn't surprise us because we don't have the record of most of the deaths of the apostles either and many of the other heroes in scripture so the last reference to Mary is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 there's nothing in scripture about her ascending to heaven after her death and after her body not seeing corruption the Bible simply is silent on anything like this now I would like to dedicate the next several minutes to portray for you the biblical picture of Jesus, who Jesus was. And I'm going to be referring to a lot of Bible verses. I'm not going to be able to read them because there are too many and our time constraints will not allow us to read all of these verses. But I will share with you the content of each verse. John chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us that Jesus was the creator of all things. All things were made through Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. We also know that Jesus was born the Holy One. According to Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, He's called that holy thing. In other words, He was holy from the moment of His birth. We also know from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 that Jesus during his life was tempted in all things and yet he never sinned, not even once. We also know from John chapter 1 and verse 14 that Jesus was full of grace and truth. So we know that Jesus definitely was full of grace. We also know from John chapter 1 and verse 14 that Jesus was born with our flesh. The Bible says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, He was our brother. He had our flesh. 
we also know from John chapter 3 and verse 16 that the Father gave His only begotten Son. In other words, the Son was given by God the Father. You're going to see in a few moments the reason why I'm referring to all of these things. Most of us probably already know them. But you're going to understand in a few moments why I'm bringing all of these things to view. We also notice in the Gospels that Jesus was a very loving, benevolent person. He healed the sick. He cast out devils. He gave encouragement. He forgave sinners. In other words, He was someone that people could approach. Someone who people could love. Also, we're told in Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 23 and 24 that Jesus is our high priest. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, he's called our only high priest. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our advocate before the Father. That's very, very important. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 tells us that Jesus is our only intercessor. We have one intercessor between God and man, Jesus Christ the man. And that's corroborated by Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. We're also told in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 that there is no name given under heaven whereby we might be saved except in the name of Jesus. And that is corroborated by Matthew 1 and verse 21 where his name is called Emmanuel because he will save the people in this world from their sins. We also notice in scripture Hebrews 9 and verse 26 that Jesus sacrificed himself. He was not sacrificed by any priest. He was not sacrificed by any person. He offered his own sacrifice according to scripture. Also we're told in John chapter 1 and verse 51 that Jesus is the ladder between heaven and earth. We're told in John 16 and verses 26 and 27 that we are to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We are to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We also notice in John chapter 1 and verse 18 that no one has ever seen God. Jesus Christ has made him known. In other words, we come to know God the Father through Jesus Christ. We notice also in Hebrews 2, 17 and 18, that Jesus helps us when we are tempted. In that he was tempted, he is powerful also to help those who are tempted. John 14 and verse 6 tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. In John 10 and verse 9, Jesus is called the door which we must enter through in order to be saved. In Isaiah 11 and verse 1, Jesus is called the root of Jesse. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, Jesus is called the only Redeemer. He has redeemed us through His blood. In Hebrews 6 and verse 18, we're told that we are to flee to Jesus for refuge. In Hebrews 4 and verse 15, once again we have the idea that Jesus gives us power to overcome temptation. In that He was tempted, He is able to help those who are tempted. Psalm 84 and verse 11, refers to Jesus as the sun. In fact, Jesus spoke of himself as the light of the world, referring to the sun. In Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4, Jesus is called our life. In 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, we're told that by beholding Jesus, we are changed into his likeness. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, we're told that Jesus is our propitiation with the Father. In other words, Jesus is the one who stands between us and God. Psalm 23 and verse 4 says that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for the Lord is with us. In other words, the Lord comforts us when we face death. Philippians 4 verse 13 speaks of Jesus as being omnipotent. He is able to help those uh, 
uh, who come to Him to overcome sin and to do deeds of omnipotence. It says there, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Revelation 22 and verse 16 calls Jesus the star. In 1 Corinthians 15 45 Jesus is called the last Adam. In Genesis 3 and verse 15 we're told that Jesus would crush the head of the serpent. In Exodus chapter 13 and verses 21 and 22 we're told that Jesus was in the pillar of cloud and He was in the pillar of fire in the wilderness guiding Israel. In Luke 10 verse 17 we're told that through the power of the name of Jesus demons can be cast out. John 4 verses 13 and 14 tells us that Jesus is the fountain of living water. In other words He is the aqueduct if you please. In Ephesians 2 and verse 14 Jesus is called our peace. In Psalm 144 and verse 2 Jesus is called our fortress and our refuge. In John 12, 32 and 33 we're told that Jesus draws all men like a magnet to Himself. In Romans 6, 23 we're told that Jesus is the one who gives eternal or everlasting life. 1 Timothy 1 verse 1 tells us that Jesus is our hope. Revelation 5, 11 to 13 tells us that Jesus is worthy to be praised by all of the heavenly beings, all of the angels, and all of the, all of the uh, inhabitants of other worlds in the heavenly realms. And in Romans 8 and verse 34 we're told that Jesus died, He resurrected, He ascended body and soul, and He's seated at the right hand of God and that His body saw no corruption in the grave. Now you're probably saying, Pastor Burr, we knew all of this. We knew all of these things about Jesus. And I'm sure that you did. Why have I taken the time to mention all of these verses? For the simple reason that now I am going to share with you the fact that the Roman Catholic Church attributes to Mary everything that the Bible attributes to Jesus. In fact I'd like to read you a statement from the writings of Saint Alphonsus Liguori who lived in the 17th century. Uh, on page 407 of his book The Glories of Mary he gives us the principle that he applies to teach that Mary has to be equal to Jesus in everything. Here's the statement. But God was pleased that Mary should in all things resemble Jesus. Now where is that in the Bible? Nowhere. It's a declaration of Ligori. But God was pleased that Mary should in all things resemble Jesus. And as her son died it was becoming that the mother should also die. Now you'll always find in the writings of Roman Catholic writers uh, expressions such as it was fitting, it was necessary, it was befitting that the mother experienced the same as her son. But we're going to notice that in Roman Catholic theology what actually happens is that Mary has become the rival of Jesus. Mary has overshadowed Jesus and has taken away the glory which belongs to Him alone. Now I'm going to read you several statements from an author, a very famous author of the Roman Catholic Church. His name is Saint Alphonsus Liguori. I'm going to tell you a few things about him so that you know why I'm going to take so many quotations from his writings. He lived in the 17th century. He wrote 22 volumes that have been published so far. 22 books in other words. He was canonized as a saint of the Roman Catholic Church in 1839 by Pope Gregory the 14th. He has been called a doctor of the church. I don't know whether you're aware but the Roman Catholic Church has 32 doctors in its almost 2,000 year history. And these are the individuals who are the most authoritative writers in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. He was actually declared a doctor of the church by Pope Pius 
the ninth. One of the books that he wrote is called The Glories of Mary. And that's the book that I'm going to quote from extensively in our study today. Now you might be thinking, well, what you find in this book is simply the opinion of St. Alphonsus Liguori. It's just the opinion of one man about Mary. Lest you think that, allow me to share with you that this book does not contain merely Liguori's opinions. In fact, the book is composed of a collection of the best writings of the early church fathers, of the doctors, and of the saints of the Roman Catholic Church about Mary. In other words, it is a compendium of the Roman Catholic wisdom about Mary from the early church all the way till the times of the 17th century when Liguori lived. Notice the reason that Liguori gives for writing his book, The Glories of Mary. He says this, I endeavored to collect from as many authors as I could lay my hands on the choicest passages extracted from fathers and theologians and those which seem to me to be the most to the point and have put them together in this book in order that the devout may with little trouble and expense be able to inflame themselves with the love of Mary and more particularly to furnish the priests with matter for their sermons wherewith to excite others to devotion towards this Divine Mother. This book is com composed of many chapters and the chapters are divided in three parts. The first part has a certain teaching about a role that Mary plays in the church. Then towards the end of the chapter he illustrates that role of Mary by according to him a real life episode. And finally he ends that chapter with a prayer to Mary having to do with the function that he has just described in that chapter. The edition of the glories of Mary that I am going to use was published in 1931 by the Redemptorist Fathers. It has the imprimatur of Cardinal Patrick Hayes and the imprimatur is from April 16, 1931. The imprimatur means that this book is officially uh, condoned by the Catholic Church to be read by the faithful. The preponderance of Ligori's quotations in this book are from the apocryphal books of Ecclesiasticus and Wisdom of Solomon. He has very few quotations from Scripture. The places that he does quote Scripture are mainly from Song of Solomon and from the Proverbs. And texts there which apply to the church he applies in his book to Mary. In fact as you read this book you discover that constantly he tears biblical texts out of their context. For example, he gives this quotation on page 101 of his book. If Mary is for us, who can be against us? That's a quotation in Romans 8.31 which applies to Jesus. Notice another example, and I could give you dozens and dozens of them. He says, Mary was prefigured by the dove which returned to Noah in the ark with an olive branch in its beak as a pledge of the peace which God granted to men. Now where in the Bible are we told that that dove represented Mary? It's simply a human opinion. There's no biblical basis for that. On page, that's page 202 by the way, on page 244 Saint Alphonsus de Ligori quotes a psalm uh, quotes a psalm that says, Glorious things are said of you, O city of God. And then he quotes Saint Gregory who said, To whom can this refer but Mary, the city of God? In another uh, quotation that we find on pages 244 and 45, Ligori says this, Correctly then, we can hear say with Saint Paul, Having this seal, the Lord knoweth who are His. And then he explains, that is to say, whoever carries with him the mark of devotion to Mary is recognized by God as His. You can read that text in the New Testament and you will not find Mary anywhere. 
she's been inserted in that passage. After Ligori died, his grave was opened in Nocera. Three fingers were cut off of his writing hand and were sent to Rome by the wish of Pope Pius VII. And Pope Pius VII said this as the reason. Let those three fingers that have written so well for the honor of God, of the Blessed Virgin, and of religion be carefully preserved and sent to Rome. Now you know some things about St. Alphonsus Liguori. And I felt that it was important for you to know because I'm going to read mostly quotations from his book The Glories of Mary which is an encyclopedia of the history of the concept that the Roman Catholic Church has had of Mary in the course of the centuries. What we're going to discover is that everything which the Bible attributes to Jesus the book The Glories of Mary attributes to Mary. Now let's go through these one by one, the ones that I mentioned at the beginning of our talk about Jesus, and I'm going to read you some quotations in Ligori's book where he applies all of these titles and all of these functions to Mary. How about the Creator? You say certainly uh, Ligori could not say that Mary was there creating with Jesus. If you don't think so, think again. Allow me to read you this statement from page 368 of his book. By the way, I read this book with a fine tooth comb very, very carefully in preparation for this lecture. He says this, and he's quoting St. Bonaventure. The world which thou with God, he's speaking about Mary, the world which thou with God didst form from the beginning continues to exist at thy will O most holy virgin. The saint adhering in this to the words of Proverbs applied by the church to Mary. And these are the words. I was with him forming all things. Saint Bernardine adds that it was for the love of Mary that God did not destroy man after Adam's sin. He preserved it on account of His most singular love for this blessed virgin. Now where in the Bible do you find such a concept? That Mary was there at the beginning creating this world with Jesus. It is absurd. Because Mary obviously had an origin long after the creation of this world. Now the Bible says that Jesus was born holy. And so St. Alphonsus Liguori says, Mary must also have been born holy. Notice this statement from page 296. Mary was conceived without sin, that the divine Son might be born of her without sin. Notice that Mary was conceived without sin, so that Jesus could also be conceived without sin. Not only that, the Bible says that Jesus never sinned during his life. So of course Mary never sinned during her life either. Notice Ligori, page 299. The Blessed Virgin never committed any actual sin, not even a venial one. And in the Roman Catholicism there are mortal sins which are the most serious and there are venial sins which, uh, which are less serious. And so what Ligori is saying is that Mary was not only conceived without sin, but he's saying that she actually during her whole life never sinned. Now the Bible says that Jesus is God in the flesh. Listen to this quotation. This isn't from Ligori. It's from Mark Miravalle, who is uh, from Spain. He wrote a book called Mary Co-Redemptrix Mediatrix Advocate, page 54. He says this, speaking about Mary and the Holy Spirit, still their union is so inexpressible and so perfect that the Holy Spirit acts only by the Immaculata, in other words by the Immaculate One, His spouse. The third person of the Blessed Trinity never took flesh. In other words the Holy Spirit never took flesh. Still our human word spouse is far too weak to express the reality of the relationship between the Immaculata and the Holy Spirit. And here comes the, the amazing portion of the quotation. We can affirm 
that she is in a certain sense the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. She would have to be God to be the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. We noticed in Scripture that Jesus is, is full of grace. Of course Mary has to be full of grace too because she's actually competing with Jesus in Roman Catholic theology. Page 155 uh, actually Ligori is quoting Father Contenson and he says speaking about uh, Jesus my wounds are ever flowing fountains of grace but their streams will reach no one but by the channel of Mary in vain will he invoke me as father who has not venerated Mary as mother. On page 159 and 160 we find this amazing, amazing statement. As the moon which stands between the sun and the earth transmits to this later whatever it receives from the former so does Mary pour out upon us who are in this world the heavenly graces which she receives from the divine son of justice. And notice the quotation he gives from Saint Bernardine, one of the great saints of the Roman Catholic Church on page 161. From the moment that this virgin mother conceived the divine word in her womb, she acquired a special jurisdiction, so to say, over all the gifts of the Holy Ghost, so that no creature has since received any grace from God otherwise than through the hands of Mary. You see she's full of grace and therefore she is the only one who is able to impart all of the graces of God to human beings. Now interestingly enough the Roman Catholic Church teaches that she took the nature of Adam before the fall. As they believe that Jesus took the nature of Adam before the fall. On page 297 of Ligori we find this quotation. For not only is it true that the flesh of Jesus is the same as that of Mary, but the flesh of our Savior even after His resurrection remained the same that He had taken from His mother. You read Ligori's book and you constantly find that Mary is loving, kind, accessible, compassionate, very sympathetic, and very easy to approach. It's interesting to notice that the Roman Catholic Church also teaches in the glories of Mary through the writings of Ligori that Mary was a priest because she offered her son on the cross. In fact, let me read you that statement on page 394 we find this according to Ligori, hence Saint Epiphanius calls her a priest. Constantly you will find the idea that Mary immolated Jesus. Immolated means to what? To sacrifice or to offer. Now if she offered Jesus she must be a priest in order to be able to offer him. And so you find several times in the book of Ligori that Mary was a priest. But of course Jesus was a priest also. Also in the book of Ligori several times you find the idea that Mary is the advocate or the mediator. Which the Bible says that only Jesus is the advocate and the mediator. Notice on page 124 he quotes Saint Bonaventure. Before Mary there was no one who could thus dare to restrain the arm of God. But now if God is angry with a sinner and Mary takes him under her protection, she withholds the avenging arm of her son and saves him. What picture of Jesus does that give? On page 196 Ligori says, Christ is a faithful and powerful mediator between God and men. But in him men fear the majesty of God. A mediator then was needed with the mediator himself. Nor could a more fitting one be found than Mary. So you need a mediator with the mediator because the mediator, Jesus, is basically unapproachable. Notice this statement from page 246. 
frequently our petitions are heeded sooner when we address ourselves to Mary the Queen of mercy and compassion then when we go directly to Jesus who is King of justice and is our judge. Can you imagine prayers being answered more quickly going through Mary than going directly to Jesus? Where in Scripture do we find such an idea? Page 246, Ligori says this, The Franciscan Chronicles relate that a certain brother Leo saw in a vision two ladders, the one red the other white. On the upper end of the red ladder stood Jesus and on the other stood His Holy Mother. The brother saw that some tried to climb the red ladder but scarcely had they mounted some rungs when they fell back. They tried again but with no better success. Then they were advised to try the white ladder and to their surprise they succeeded for the Blessed Virgin stretched out her hand and with her aid they reached heaven. That's blasphemy folks. When you say that, that Mary is more compassionate than Jesus is, it totally flies in the face of the scriptural evidence. On page 256, uh, Ligori quotes Saint Fulgentius, Oh, how long since would the world have been destroyed had not Mary sustained it by her powerful intercession. He also quotes a, a, a prayer by Saint Ephraim and this is incredible. Page 273, O Immaculate Virgin, we are under thy protection and therefore unitedly we have recourse to thee. And we beseech thee to prevent thy beloved Son who is irritated by our sins from abandoning, abandoning us to the power of the devil. Saint Bernard, according to Ligori, pray this prayer, we fly to thy protection, appease the wrath of thy Son, and restore us to his grace. According to Ligori's book, Mary is not only our advocate, but she's also our mediator and our intercessor. Listen to this amazing quotation from page 117. And this is a prayer. O Mother of Holy Love, our life, our refuge, and our hope. Did we notice that Jesus is all those three things? Our life, our refuge, our hope? Thou well knowest that thy Son Jesus Christ, not content with being himself our perpetual advocate, with the Eternal Father, has willed that thou shouldest interest thyself with Him in order to obtain the divine mercies for us. Page 164, they found the child with Mary his mother. That's a quotation from Scripture. Reminds us that if we wish to find Jesus, we must go to Mary. We may then conclude that in vain shall we seek for Jesus unless we endeavor to find Him with Mary. Page 38, there's so many of these that I could read. He says, Ernest, Archbishop of Prague, also remarks that the Eternal Father gave the office of judge and avenger to the Son, and that of showing mercy and relieving the necessitous to the mother. On page 43, he says, Although Mary is under an infinite obligation to the Son for having chosen her to be his mother, Yet it cannot be denied that the Son is under great obligation to her for having given Him His humanity. And therefore Jesus, to pay as it were what He owes to Mary, and glorying in her glory, honors her in a special manner by listening to and granting all her petitions. On pages 136 and 137, he quotes Saint Anselm in the following way. When we have recourse to this Divine Mother, not only we may be sure of her protection, but that often we shall be heard more quickly and be thus preserved. If we have recourse to Mary and call on her holy name, then we should, 
if we called on the name of Jesus our Savior. And what is the reason Anselm gives for this? That to Jesus as judge it belongs also to punish, but mercy alone belongs to the Blessed Virgin as a patroness. Page 137, he says this, Many things are asked from God and are not granted. They are asked from Mary and they are obtained. You remember that we read that Jesus is the Savior according to Scripture? Listen to this quotation that we find in chapter 8 which the title of this chapter is Mary Our Salvation. It's amazing. He quotes Novarinus who says loving mother no sooner hears them call the loving mother no sooner hears them call upon her then she offers her prayers to God and these prayers as a heavenly dew immediately refresh them in their burning pains. She's talking about those who are burning in the fires of purgatory. He also quotes uh, on page 247 the prayer to Mary which is titled Salve Regina. O Mary, I hope most certainly to be saved by thy means. Pray to Jesus for me. Nothing else is needed. Thou hast to save me. Thou art my hope. I will therefore always sing, O Mary, my hope. Thou hast to save me. According to Scripture, who is the only Savior? Jesus Christ. But because in all things Mary has to be like Jesus, Mary also is declared the Savior. On page 170, we find uh, these words of Liguori, speaking about Mary as Savior. Saint Bernardine of Siena thus addresses this Blessed Virgin, O Lady, since thou art the dispenser of all graces, and since the grace of salvation can only come through thy hands, our salvation depends on thee. The Bible says that Jesus offered his life as a sacrifice. Notice according to Liguori who offered Jesus as a sacrifice. Page 49, Saint William says that Mary, in order that she might save many souls, exposed her own to death. Meaning that to save us she sacrificed the life of her son. And this is only one quotation of many. The Bible says that God gave His Son. Well, if God gave His Son, of course, Roman Catholics say Mary had to give her Son too. So in, on page 35 we find this statement. Thus it is, as it is written of the Eternal Father, that God so loved the world as to give His only begotten Son, so also we can say of Mary, that she so loved the world as to give her only begotten Son. That's page 35. You remember the Bible says that Jesus is the latter? Notice this statement, page 20 of Liguori. He's quoting Saint Bernard. This Divine Mother, O oh my children, is the ladder of sinners, by which they reascend to the height of divine grace. She is my greatest confidence. She is the whole ground of my hope. Notice this one on page 83. With reason does Saint Bernard call her the sinner's ladder, since she the most compassionate queen, extending her hand to them, draws them from the abyss of sin and enables them to ascend to God. So she's the latter. What about prayer? We're supposed to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. The idea according to Liguori time and again in the book is that we are to pray to Jesus through Mary. Notice this statement on page 162. He's quoting actually the words of the venerable abbot of Sel. She says, address, or he says, address yourselves to the most blessed virgin, for by her, and in her, and with her, and from her, the world receives, and is to receive, every good. 
I don't know about you, but I'm simply amazed at reading these statements. And these are only a sampling of the statements that we find in this book, The Glories of Mary. Now the Bible says that we know the Father through Jesus. Notice page 171 of Ligori's book. There is no one, O oh most bless, O oh most holy Mary, who can know God but through thee. No one can be saved or redeemed but through thee, O Mother of God. No one who can be delivered from the dangers but through thee, O Virgin Mother. No one who obtains mercy but through thee, O filled with all grace. So the only way that we can know Jesus and the Father, according to Ligori, is through the instrumentality of Mary. The Bible says that Jesus helps us when we are tempted. Well, obviously, we must conclude that Mary has to help people when they're tempted. Notice page, uh, this is a different book. No, it's actually The Glories of Mary, page 58. When we are tempted, says St. Thomas of Villanova, all we need to do is what little chicks do. As soon as they see a hawk, they run under the wings of the mother hen. And this is the way we should act when tempted. Not linger to reason with the danger, but immediately fly and take cover under Mary's mantle. Now, we, the Bible says that Jesus is the door. Of course, Mary would have to be the door too. Notice Ligori, page 153. And St. Lawrence, Lawrence Justinian asks, How can she be otherwise than full of grace? Who has been made the ladder to paradise, the gate of heaven, the most true mediatrice between God and man? On page 160, we find this quotation. St. Bonaventure says that Mary is called the gate of heaven. Because no one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. On page uh, 239, he quotes St. Ambrose, who says this, Open to us, O Mary, the gates of paradise, since thou hast its keys. Nay more, the church says that thou art its gate. Finally, on page 43, we find this remarkable statement. Supposedly Mary appeared to St. Bridget and said these words, I am the queen of heaven and the mother of mercy. I am the joy of the just and the door through which sinners are brought to God. You see, Jesus is no longer the door. Mary is the door. You remember the rod of Jesse? It says in Isaiah 11 and verse 1 that Jesus is the rod of Jesse. It's a messianic prophecy. Listen to Ligori, page 101. Cardinal Hugo, explaining these words about the rod and the staff of Psalm 23 and verse 4, these words of the royal prophet, says that the staff signifies the cross. And the rod is the intercessory, in, intercession of Mary. For she is the rod foretold by the prophet Isaiah, and there shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse, and a flower shall rise up out of his root. Quoting Isaiah 11 and verse 1 and applying it to Mary. The Bible says that Jesus is the Redeemer. Well, you would have to conclude that Mary is also the Redeemer or co-redemptrix. We're going to talk about this a little bit later on in our series. I have to move on. You remember, remember that we're supposed to flee to Jesus who is our refuge? Notice Ligori, page 119. Speaking about the six cities of refuge. Nowadays, these cities are not so numerous. There is but one. And that is Mary, of whom the psalmist says, Glorious things are said of thee, O city of God. Constantly he says that we're to flee to Mary for refuge. In Hebrews 6 verse 18 it says we're to flee to Jesus for refuge. In Hebrews chapter 4, we're told that we're supposed to come to the throne of grace for help in time of trial. Notice Ligori, page 257. He's quoting Saint, Saint Antoninus. Mary is that throne of grace to which the apostle Saint Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews exhorts us to fly with confidence that we may, may obtain the divine mercy and all the help we need for our salvation. Hebrews says that it was Jesus. 
We notice that Jesus according to Scripture is the Son. S-U-N. Ligori says in page 90, take away the Son, and where will be the day? Take away Mary, and what will be left but the darkest night? When a soul loses devotion to Mary, it is immediately enveloped in darkness. Page 55. If Mary ignores and condemns someone, that person is inevitably lost. Therefore, woe to those who turn their back on this Son. S-U-N. You remember the Bible says that Jesus is our life? Well, Mary would have to be our life, according to Roman Catholic theology. Ligori, page 91. Saint Germanus called the most blessed virgin the breath of Christians. For as the body cannot live without breathing, so the soul cannot live without having recourse to and recommending itself to Mary, by whose means we certainly acquire and preserve the life of divine grace within our souls. The Bible says that we're transformed by contemplating Jesus, by beholding Jesus. Notice what Ligori says about how we're changed. Page 70, Thou art so pure, and I defiled with many sins. Thou so humble, and I so proud. Thou so holy, and I so wicked. This then is what thou must do, the, what thou hast to do, O Mary. Since thou lovest me, make me like thee. Thou hast all power to change hearts. Did you catch that? Thou hast all power to change hearts. Take then mine and change it. Show the world what thou canst do for those who love thee. Make me a saint. Make me thy worry, uh, my worthy child. This is my hope. Scripture says that we're protected from the power of Satan through Jesus. Notice this statement in Ligori, page 148. As wax melts before the fire, so do the devils lose their power against those souls who often remember the name of Mary and devoutly invoke it, and still more so if they also endeavor to imitate her virtues. Scripture says that Jesus is our propitiation. Page 178 of the glories of Mary, we find this statement of Ligori. It's actually a prayer of his at the end of a chapter. He says, I do not even fear an angry God, for a single prayer of thine will appease him. That's page 178. Does God need to be appeased? Doesn't God love us? The Bible says that Jesus has a name that is exalted above every other name. Notice this amazing statement. Page 260. The whole Trinity, O Mary, gave thee a name after that of thy Son above every other name, that in thy name every knee should bow of things in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That's Philippians chapter 2. It applies to Jesus there. You remember the Bible says that when we die, our hope is found in Jesus? Well, notice page 103 of Ligori. Speaking about Richard of St. Lawrence, he asks, who would dare accuse one who is patronized by the mother of him who is to judge? Mary not only assists her beloved servants at death and encourages them, but she herself accompanies them to the tribunal seat of God. Well, you have two problems there. The state of the dead problem, <laughs> and you have the problem of her accompanying the person who has died to the tribunal of God. The Bible says that Jesus is omnipotent. He can do all things. Listen to this amazing statement. Page 181. He's quoting Richard of St. Lawrence. Yes, Mary is omnipotent. For the queen by every law enjoys the same privileges of the king. And as the power of the son and that of the mother is the same, a mother is made omnipotent by an omnipotent son. On page 275, he quotes a prayer of Saint Germanus of Constantinople. O Mary, thou art omnipotent to save sinners. Thou needest, nor needest thou any other recommendation, for thou art the mother of true life. 
Jesus is the morning star. So of course Mary has to be the star. Page 122. He quotes Saint Bernard. If thou wouldest not be lost in the tempest, cast thine eyes on the star and invoke Mary. The mercy seat that was above the Ark of the Covenant represents the throne of God. But of course in Roman Catholic theology the mercy seat is Mary. Notice this quotation from page 111. In the book of Exodus we read that God commanded Moses to make a mercy seat of the purest gold because it was thence that he would speak to him. Saint Andrew of Crete says that the whole world embraces Mary as being this propitiatory which is actually the meaning of the word mercy seat. The Bible says that Jesus is the last Adam so of course Mary has to be the last Eve. Now notice this statement. Uh, this is found on page 113. Hence Saint Irenaeus remarks that as Eve was seduced by a fallen angel to flee from God so Mary was led to receive God into her womb obeying a good angel and thus by her obedience repaired Eve's disobedience and became her advocate and that of the whole human race. On page 165 he quotes Saint Bernard that as a man and a woman cooperated in our ruin so it was proper that another man and another woman should cooperate in our redemption and these two were Jesus and his mother Mary. The Bible says that Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. Notice in Ligori page 141 according to him who crushed the head of the serpent. From the very beginning God foretold the victory and empire that our queen would one day obtain over the serpent. Who would obtain over the serpent? Our what? Our queen. When he announced that a woman should come into the world to conquer him. I will put enmities between thee and the woman, she shall crush thy head. On page 142 we find this statement about Genesis 3.15. Mary then was this great and valiant woman who conquered the devil and crushed his head by bringing down his pride and as it was foretold by God himself, she shall crush thy head. Some doubt as to whether these words refer to Mary or whether they do not rather refer to Jesus Christ. For the Septuagint renders them, He shall crush thy head. But in the Vulgate, which alone was approved by the sacred council of Trent, we find she and not he, and thus it was understood by Saint Ambrose, Saint Jerome, Saint Augustine, and a great many others. Quoting tradition, quoting the fathers. Scripture says that Jesus was in the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. Guess who is in the pillar of fire and the pillar, pillar of cloud according to Roman Catholic theology? Page 147. It is said in the Old Testament that God guided His people from Egypt to the land of promise. By day in a pillar of cloud and by night in a pillar of fire. This stupendous pillar at times as a cloud at others of fire says Richard of St. Lawrence was a figure of Mary fulfilling the double office she constantly exercises for our good. As a cloud she protects us from the ardor of or the burning of divine justice and as fire she protects us from the devils. The Bible says that we're supposed to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. Ligori says it's supposed to be done in the name of Mary. Notice page 96. This is a, a, a very humorous example. Bernardine de Bustis relates that a bird was taught to say Hail Mary. A hawk was on the point of seizing it when the bird cried out Hail Mary. In an instant the hawk fell dead. God intended to show thereby that if even an irrational creature was preserved by calling on Mary how much more would those who are prompt in calling on her when assaulted by devils be delivered from them. Page 265 he quotes Thomas a Kempis. Thomas a Kempis affirms that the devils fear the Queen of Heaven to such a degree that only on hearing her great name pronounced they then fly from him who does so as from a burning fire. 
our time is just about up. But you know Jesus is the water of life. So guess who is the aqueduct according to Ligori? This is page 159 quoting Saint Bernard. Before the birth of the Blessed Virgin a constant flow of graces was wanting because this aqueduct did not exist. Jesus according to the Bible is the peacemaker. Notice Ligori page 197. He's quoting a prayer of William of Paris. Since then, O Mary, thy office is to be the peacemaker between God and men. Let thy tender compassion, with fa which far exceeds all my sins, move thee to succor me, and that is to help me. She's called the Tower of Refuge. That's on page 201. On page 205, we're told that Mary draws all men to herself. On page 243, we're told that she gives eternal life. She's, according to Ligori, page 29, she's worthy of being praised and glorified by all of the heavenly hosts. Notice this quotation. If all the tongues of men were put together, and even if each of their members was changed into a tongue, they would not suffice to praise her as much as she deserves. She's called our hope. She's, we are saved by her merits. She's called the rainbow. And finally, Roman Catholic theology teaches, and we'll study this later on, that when Mary died, her body saw no corruption. She was buried. She resurrected the third day. She ascended to heaven, and she sat at the right hand of Jesus. Now you tell me where the Bible gives any of this scenario about Mary. Nowhere. What has happened is this book has totally stolen the glory which belongs to Jesus and it has given it to a creature, Mary. Our only hope, folks, is found in Jesus, not in a creature.